She wasn't even two years old when she died, said her mother. Too little to understand. Maybe she don't want to understand, said her sister. Ohio had been calling itself a state only 70 years when first one brother and then the next snatched up his shoes and crept away from the lively spike the house felt for them. There's my house. That's where I was born, up there oh. in the attic. My mother said it was very cold up there. <laughs> mm, you had a terrace. You Is call that, that you... a terrace? That's a porch. <laughs> Only hookers were born in hospitals in those days. Really? Married women had their babies at home. For a baby, she throws a powerful spell, said Denver. No more powerful than the way I loved her, said the answer. Who would have thought a little old baby could harbor so much rage? We could move, Seka suggested once. What'd be the point? Not a house in the country ain't packed to its rafters with some dead Negro's grief. We're lucky this ghost is a baby. This is me in the first grade with a dress my grandmother made. It was red, and I have this bow in my hair that is braided so tight you can barely <laughs> close your eyes. That little girl is now often called America's national writer, their first lady of literature. She's now an honored citizen of her hometown. Who is Toni Morrison? Zoe? It says here that Toni was the first African-American and the eighth woman to win the Nobel Prize. I think that's cool because she must have inspired a lot of African-American people. What would you thank her for? I would thank her for writing these books because so we know how people feel back then. She shows what African-Americans had to go through. Now I can have friends that are different races like Julian because he's my best friend. Discrimination. It's still going on till today because some people hate the president that we have because of his race. Toni Morrison has reimagined her own past and with it, that of black America, especially of black women. I always felt like a partial American or as kind of a fraudulent American. And finally not American at all, just I felt like a black person. But when this Nobel Prize was given to me, I felt American, probably for the first time. Toni Morrison for Oret's Nobel Prize in Literature. She may be establishment, but she's still 100% radical. Her books are taught in schools, but they're banned in some. Her recurrent theme of childhood trauma is too much for some people to face. She's feisty, forthright, an uneasy heroine for a still troubled nation. Nowadays, Toni Morrison lives in an apartment high up in downtown Manhattan. But her quite astonishing first novel was set in her hometown. It's about a black girl who longed to have blue eyes. When The Bluest Eye first came out, the reaction to it was pretty negative by a lot of the black community, wasn't it? Well, the black community didn't like it because it was oh, incest. I mean, you know, my sister banned it. You talk about bad books. She said she wouldn't let her children read it until they were 18. And they didn't sell any copies of it. It was very low. And um, I got $3,000, 
which I spent taking my mother and my father and my children to Aruba. We had a hell of a time. It was fantastic. For people who never, you know, my mother came home, she was talking about, do you know what? They wash out your tub. And do you know, they turn your bed down. None of this had ever been done for her. She was in ecstasy. That was the benefit of the bluest eye for me. The main character, Piccola, is the victim not just of white society, but of her black father. There were no marigolds in the fall of 1941. We thought at the time that it was because Piccola was having her father's baby that the marigolds did not grow. We could think of nothing but our own magic. If we planted the seeds and said the right words over them, they would blossom and everything would be all right. We had dropped our seeds in our own little plot of black dirt, just as Piccola's father had dropped his seeds in his own plot of black dirt. The seeds shriveled and died, her baby too. The trigger for that creation of Piccola in the bluest eye was in fact a, a girl that you met at school, was it? It was. I think we were 10 or 11. She was a close friend and um, we were quarreling about the existence of God. And I was very certain that there was a God and she was very certain that there was not. And then she stopped the conversation and the argument by saying she had proof <laughs> of his non-existence. And I said, what is it? And she said, I have been praying for two years for blue eyes. And obviously he has not delivered. <laughs> it was a real epiphany because I looked at her and thought, this would be awful if God had given her blue eyes. And I realized she was absolutely beautiful. And at 10, you don't think in those terms. Somebody's cute or, you know, whatever, but not beauty. And that was the first time I saw it. She's very dark. She had these wonderful almond eyes, high cheekbones, loved, I mean, <laughs> you could go on. And she wanted something other. Well, you know, we all had these little dolls, these little blonde dolls that the grown-ups gave us with affection. And the Shirley Temple, the and the Sh Mary Jane, oh, and God. all those things. <laughs> the Bojangles. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I hated Shirley Temple, not because she was cute, but because she danced with Bojangles, who was my friend, my uncle, my daddy, and who ought to have been soft-shoeing it and chuckling with me. Instead, he was enjoying, sharing, giving a lovely dance thing with one of those little white girls whose socks never slid down under their heels. I destroyed white baby dolls. But the dismembering of dolls was not the true horror. The truly horrifying thing was the transference of the same impulses to little white girls. Is that what drove you to write? Because you had to tell a story because you felt it hadn't been told. I thought somebody probably wrote that book, but I didn't know what it was. And every little black child in literature or in theater was a joke or a pet, a topsy, like in Uncle Tom's Cabin. And I, was one of those little people, and I wanted to read about such a child. It took five years for me to write that really small book um, to pay attention 
pay attention to this child. It may be, maybe she's in difficulty. She's obviously hurt. Uh, she's abused and misused. But take her seriously, please. It was a world full of secrets. There used to be a house behind our house, a small little, almost like a shed. And a woman lived in there, and her name was Trope. We were not allowed to go there. My grandmother thought she was, she wasn't a street walker, but she had, she invited people in. <laughs> nice looking woman. And I thought about her a lot because she was the hidden, you know, don't go over there because. <laughs> Other places were out of bounds too. We can't go all the way to the lake. Yes, we can. Come on. We walked down tree-lined streets of soft gray houses leaning like tired ladies. The streets changed. Houses looked more sturdy, their paint was newer, porch posts straighter, yards deeper. The lakefront houses were the loveliest. Garden furniture, ornaments, windows like shiny eyeglasses. The backyards of these houses fell away in green slopes down to a strip of sand, and then the blue Lake Erie, lapping all the way to Canada. We reached a city park laid out with rosebuds, fountains, picnic tables. It was empty now, but sweetly expectant of clean, white, well-behaved children and parents who would play there above the lake in summer before half running, half stumbling down the slope to the welcoming water. Black people were not allowed in the park, and so it filled our dreams. Tony was looking back to her childhood in the 30s and 40s, the sense of exclusion, the longing to be white. But she was writing this in the 1960s. There was a, a black proposition around, and black is beautiful in the 60s, and a sort of sense of, let's move on. But you weren't ready to move on. You wanted to no, go no, back. No. I thought there was this little, I understood black is beautiful. But I was, that was a generation a little bit younger than me. And I thought, wait a minute, why do you, you have to say that? Of course we are. And then, is that all? It's about beauty again? Is that what makes us human, acceptable? And besides, it's too frail. It was part of what I really despised, which was addressing white people. Who are you talking to? You talking to me? No, <laughs> I know I'm beautiful or doesn't matter to me. You're talking to white people who are saying you're not, and therefore you should be segregated or oppressed. I'm not talking to white people. I'm talking in my books. I'm reading them. So I'm talking to me, which means I'm talking to black people. Whereas actually whatever black is beautiful was, it was a sort of belong to the other, to the white gaze. That's right, the white it was gaze, the white man's gaze. Which is your phrase, which is... Yes, that's what I wanted to avoid. Once, I always say this, once I took white people out, I say white men, but I meant white people, it's like the whole world opened up. You could imagine anything, yeah. everything. It was instead of that little... What Jimmy Baldwin used to say, inside each of us, a little white man lives on our shoulders. What's remarkable in your books is, is the empathy you show for men as, as well as women. Even the rapist of this, mm -hmm. of this vulnerable child. Yeah. He himself is vulnerable. There is that terrible it's, scene yeah, where, he's, uh, where he is caught. His first sexual encounter. Yeah, when he's, he's innocent. He's innocent. After some trouble with the buttons, 
Charlie dropped his pants down to his knees. But the excitement collecting inside him made him close his eyes and regard her moans as no more than pine sighs over his head. Just as he felt an explosion threaten, Darlene froze and cried out. He thought he'd hurt her, but when he looked at her face, she was staring wildly at something over his shoulder. He jerked around. There stood two white men, one with a spirit lamp, the other with a flashlight. There was no mistake about their being white. He could smell it. The men had long guns. Get on with it, nigger, said the flashlight one. Sir, said Cholly, trying to find a buttonhole. I said, get on with it and make it good, nigger, make it good. There was no place for Cholly's eyes to go. I mean, this is one character of many in here. And he is, in a way, the villain of the piece, you could say. If mm -hmm. you read it. And yet there were so many stages in his, in his life mm -hmm. and in his experience. And they don't necessarily come in sequence. That's the other thing about yeah. your books. We get some clues, a bit mm. like a detective story, and mm. enough to intrigue us. It's like life, isn't it? You, things happen, you're not quite sure mm -hmm. what happened, and then suddenly it all makes yeah, sense later. blazes before you. I don't read my books, except publicly when somebody asks me. Do you know, I read... Beloved, a couple of weeks ago. I was signing it for somebody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You're welcome. And I just happened to turn to the first page and I started reading and I kept reading and I kept reading. And it, I said to him something I normally don't say, I sometimes think. I said, it's really good. Now, when you've been reading passages from The Bluest Eye, I'm thinking the same thing. Did I do that wrong? You did not do anything wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I wish the world knew that. <laughs> Thank you for everything. She's my reason for being a literary critic. And inspired by S. Solomon Shit, S. A. L. A. Am I? I'm out of It took all my strength. <laughs> oh, oh my God. parents' imagination. Yeah. Thank you for being here. So many of my students tell me, I just love the bluest eye. And it's because it's a book that has saved a lot of girls. I thought about asking you to sign your name on my arm under your quote here. Well, my goodness. The first time I saw her, it was so amazing to see and a little bit alarming how people glommed onto her. It was a largely black crowd, and they were so proud of her and also um, wanting that, the connection that I learned, yearned for myself. Because anyone with that kind of understanding of, of black life, let alone maleness and femaleness, you do want them to cozy up to you and tell you a few things about how to live yourself. You were fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. My pleasure. Next, please. What I liked about her almost immediately was how welcoming she was. She made a sort of welcome table wherever she sat and also her incredible sense of humor. <laughs> and people are always amazed that, you know, you, if you're that smart, then you can't be that funny, too. But she gets to do both. Oh. <laughs> Would you get us started with a reading from that novel before hey. we start our conversation? <laughs> I just happened to have. <laughs> Toni Morrison is making a now rare public appearance to promote her new book. Now, if I pause in the reading, it's not because I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's that I think I probably need and don't have my glasses. <laughs> At any anyway, rate, I'm just going to read a couple of pages in the voice and tell the story of a young girl who is called Rain, because that's where the people who are taking care of her found her, sitting on the steps 
shivering in the rain. I don't want to kill them like I used to when I first got here. But then I wanted to kill everybody until they brought me a kitten. She's a cat now, and I tell her everything. My black lady listens to me tell how it was. Steve won't let me talk about it, neither will Evelyn. They think I can read, but I can't. Well, maybe a little signs and stuff. Evelyn's trying to teach me. She calls it homeschooling. I call it home drooling <laughs> and home fooling. We're a fake family. Okay, but fake. Evelyn is a good substitute mother, but I'd rather have a sister like my black lady. When we started walking back home, after I told her everything about my life, before Evelyn and Steve, a truck with big boys in it passed us. One of them hollered, hey, Rain, who's your mammy? My black lady didn't turn around, but I stuck out my tongue and thumbed my nose at him. One of them was Regis, a boy I know, because he comes to our house sometimes with his father to give us firewood or baskets of corn. The driver, an older boy, turned the truck around so they could come after us. Regis pointed a shotgun, just like Steve's at us. My black lady saw him and threw her arm in front of my face. The bird shot messed up her hand and arm. We fell, both of us, her on top of me. My heart was beating fast because nobody had done that before. I mean, Steve and Evelyn took me in and all, but nobody put their own self in danger to save me. You really inspired me. <laughs> Tony has a fantastic memory, especially for childhood. She really remembers how a small thing can overwhelm a child you know, the taste of something or um, the ability that children have to do that. Uh, and most adults lose this ability. I know a lot about Tony's childhood that she's discussed with me. Um, and I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, what's amazing to me is that Tony is not, an, she's not an angry person. You know, there's a lot of anger in her books. And it's an anger that obviously partakes of the totally appropriate anger of American blacks about what was done to them and what is still being done to them in a very different way. But that's always mixed with something personal. And I don't know Tony's history as a child, as a young girl enough to know whether she is an angry person or was an angry person and that the anger that she expresses for this external reason, the history of Blacks in America, isn't also connected to a personal anger because you can't separate these things. You talk about your father, his anger with white mm -hmm. men. How did that manifest itself when you were a child? Well, he wouldn't let them in the house. You know, an insurance guy would have to stand out if he was in the house. And um, he always said they will never be better. Nothing good will happen with white people, ever. And it was personal. I think I was telling a story of watching him throw a white man down the steps. And uh, the person I was talking to said, well, didn't you feel horrified at the violence? And I said, no, I thought, oh, my father, is strong enough to protect me. Mm. You have to know that we were evicted from every place. You know, were you the, really? Why was that then? Because we were all poor. I mean, the rent was $4 yeah. a week. <laughs> Sometimes you can't make it. My father's working three jobs. My mother's not working. So I don't know what, how. $4 doesn't sound like much, but for them it was. 
You know, you get 25 cents here, 30 cents there. You got, you got to do stuff. But my mother, when they put the eviction notice up on the wall, she just snatched it off. <laughs> <laughs> We were always moving, and from one, you know, everybody was moving because you couldn't stay anywhere. Uh, the money ran out, and then, wonderfully, for improvement, there was World War II. People of my father's age, say 38, 40, with a family, were not drafted, and got jobs in shipyards. He was a welder. A welder, paying decent money. And eventually, you know, we bought a house. You know, the man who threw that white man down the steps is the same man who told me I was working for a white woman when I was around 12, cleaning up after school. Yes, a dom you were a domestic. I was a domestic, very happy to be it. I got $2 every week. And uh, I gave one to my mother, and one I could keep. But when I started at this woman's house, I told my father, she's mean to me, Daddy. She complains all the time. And he said, go to work, get your money, and come on home. You don't live there. The one place she virtually did live was the local library, where she read and read, and later got a job that she much preferred to cleaning. In those days, children's books, the fairy tales, were on the bottom shelf where you could read them. And the next shelf was Faulkner, yeah. or Tulsa. Yeah. There was no YA, young adult. There was no transition yeah. physically. They just put all the fairy tales down there, and then they got serious. My grandparents, they were Southerners. They were sharecroppers. They were unschooled, and they couldn't read. They were in a world where it was against the law to read. You could go to jail or be fined if you were white and taught a black person to read. That says it all about reading. So my family took the whole thing very seriously. It was like a revolutionary act. So as a child, she read all the classics. But stories also came from her mother, who was brought up in the South. My mother was eight when she left. She talked about the South like it was paradise. Did she? Oh, yeah. She talked about ghosts that she'd seen in the woods. She talked about relatives. And it was like this fairy tale place for her. And she was always smiling when she remembered it. But she never went back. My father, who said he hated it, went back every year to visit relatives and so on. And then. There were ghost stories that you're... Oh, yes. Ghost stories, killings. I mean, you know, think of Little Red Riding Hood. That's grotesque. Every story was a horror story. Then there was the radio. When you listen to a little 15-minute narrative on the radio as it was in the 30s, you had to imagine it because you could only hear it. You Three. had to picture it. Yes, you had to picture it. E you sinners, hear my call. Satan's waiting for you all. The third thing, which is really important, is that my mother sang all the time. And she had the best voice I have ever heard in my life. Mm. You know, maybe Jesse Norman, but that's a tight <laughs> race. I have said to her very often that um, she wasn't so much writing as she was channeling. The ancestors were speaking through her, and I think they continue to do so. And she doesn't deny it. She accepts my silliness when I'm talking to, talking to her about her writing. 
but I really do feel that there is so much to be said, so many experiences, the collective and the individual experiences. She doesn't spare the rod, she tells the truth. And she tells it in a way that makes it possible for people who are resistant to this history to simply, they're forced to embrace it, forced to acknowledge it, and forced to recognize the power of her words, my goodness. It's after the Civil War, and black Southerners are establishing their own settlements in the West. Here, freedom was not entertainment, like a carnival or a hoedown that you can count on once a year. Here, freedom was a test administered by the natural world that a man had to take for himself every day. And if he passed enough tests long enough, he was king. They were proud that none of their women had ever worked in a white man's kitchen or nursed a white child. Although field labor was harder and carried no status, they believed the rape of women who worked in white kitchens was if not a certainty, a distinct possibility, neither of which they could bear to contemplate. So they exchanged that danger for the relative safety of brutal work. Tony does most of her writing now, not in her New York apartment, but in her boathouse up the Hudson River. A fire here 20 years ago destroyed most of her possessions, but she did save some family photos and her high school yearbook from when she graduated in 1949. We're nearly there, the V's. Those are the V's? Yeah. She was called Chloe Wofford then. Zawada Whitaker Wilcox. <laughs> Where am I? There she is. This is Chloe Wofford. She's been dolled up for it as well, for the occasion. I wore earrings, no one yeah. else did. Wow. Now here you are in this picture. They led the 1949ers. Does that mean that you distinguished yourself? Yes, well, I was the treasurer. Great skirt, I remember it's dark maroon. And, and white cream. socks. Oh, yes. <laughs> Big yeah. white socks. We all wore those. Physical education. Oh, dear. Senior and junior girls who are interested in books are given an opportunity to work in the school library under the direction of Miss Pitts. Oh, yes. I remember her. What was she like? She was rather sweet. Oh. Miss Pitts was the typing teacher. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, in those days, women who were teachers were highly, highly respected. It was one of the few professional jobs. So they were very proud of themselves, and we looked up to them. Home economics, that's called cooking in English. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dear Lord. From school, she went on to Howard in Washington, the most prestigious of the black universities. Oh, wow, now that is a picture. <laughs> Howard University coming home, queen, <laughs> runner-up, Tony no, Morris. I didn't win. You should have won, look at that. He's a good-looking guy. Yeah, they were all lovely. Yeah. Without any drowsiness or warning, she fell asleep. There, out of that dark void, sprang a vivid, fully felt dream. Booker's hand was moving between her thighs, and when her arms flew up and closed over his back, he extracted his fingers and slid between her legs what they call the pride and wealth of nations. She wrapped her legs around his rocking hips as though to slow them or help them or keep them there. Bride woke up moist and humming. I did say to Tony very early on, I really like your sex scenes. So, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's like more, more. Oh, yeah. But they're all so different, aren't they? The book yeah. is full of them. There's one in Sula where um, 
Sula gets into bed with her lover and wants desperately for him to make love to her, and he won't. And I remember as a teenager, I, I thought, well, this is horrible. <laughs> this is like my idea of a, of a nightmare. And this, and this one completely different. They're all different, but luscious. God Help the Child gives a modern twist to the themes of her first novel, the favouring of light-skinned over dark, not just white over black, but a hierarchy among black people too. This reared its head at college in the South. You know, I learned about what we call skin privileges when I went away to college. Powerful racial discrimination. If I saw a white man walking down the street and I was by myself, I'd cross the street. If I saw a black man, I would run toward him for safety. And on campus, where I was feeling safe and happy, there was this other kind of discrimination where people were ranked on the color of their skin socially. In the new novel, the main character is rejected by her mother because she is too dark, but as an adult, makes a virtue of her ebony blackness. I became a deep, dark beauty who doesn't need Botox for kissable lips or tanning spas to hide a death-like pallor. I sold my elegant blackness to all those childhood ghosts. I have to say, forcing those tormentors, the real ones and others like them, to drool with envy when they see me is more than payback. It's glory. Toni Morrison studied and later taught at Howard. Her friend, Jesse Norman, was there soon after. Unlike Toni, Jesse was brought up in the South. It must have been a defining experience for her as a writer. I'm certain that it had to be. Imagine the students that were there and their stories from Arkansas and Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi and all of these incredible experiences. And so that had to have been a widening of her own thought about what had happened and what was still happening and what, unfortunately, is still happening. I recognize everything that she, she writes because it actually happened. And it wasn't that long ago that we had people gathering at a lynching, a person with a rope or something around the neck and hung from a tree that people gathered to look at this as though it were some sort of entertainment. It wasn't that long ago. Bear a strange fruit. Lynchings carried on well into the 20th century. This was in 1911. It was fashionable to take photographs of lynchings and circulate them as postcards. From the poplar tree. Toni Morrison put pictures like that into a book she edited, The Black Book, a sort of scrapbook which gave black people a history. The book for which she later became famous, beloved, was inspired by this cutting. When the slave hunters came to the house in which they were concealed, she caught a shovel and struck two of her children on the head and cut the throat of the third. Black Book was the fruit of the civil rights movement and black power. She was now Tony, not Chloe, and Morrison after a man she'd married and divorced. She was working in publishing. It was her form of activism. I thought, I'm not out in the streets marching. I'm not giving speeches, etc. It's a very active time. So I thought, well, I want the voices documented. I don't want them distorted by this columnist or this political. I want them to say what they say. And so I deliberately chose Tony K. Bambara, Gail Jones, the writers, the poets, uh, Dumas, who's an incredible writer. 
along with the political figures, their story. It was delivered, it was calculated, and I thought, I can't leave that up to them. <laughs> she published Muhammad Ali, the boxer who was persona non grata in some circles since he changed his name and started championing black political causes. Muhammad Ali was powerless. He didn't pay much attention to me as an editor in the beginning. If I asked him a question, he would answer a man or turn to a man. And I thought, oh, God. <clears throat> and the men, the sales force, the other guys, they were in awe. Look at his hands. Oh, my, did you see his? They weren't going to tell him anything. Ali did anything he wanted to do. And I thought, this is not going to work. And then I remembered an article in the New York Times where an older woman was being evicted. He did something to prevent it. And I thought, he respects older women. So I went into my mommy role. <laughs> and while everybody else was ooing and aahing, I say, Ali, get up from there. And he would stand up. I said, go over there, sit down. The reporters are coming in. He did everything I said, so long as I was not a girl. It's extremely difficult to win the revolutionary struggle. No more prisons. In the lengthening list of embattled black militants, the name and already the legend of Angela Davis are unique. Another fighter that Tony edited was the FBI's most wanted, Angela Davis, a young academic, a communist, a Black Panther. She bought the gun that was used by black prisoners in an escape bid. A highly controversial figure, she became a heroine of the left. Toni Morrison contacted me uh, shortly after I was released from jail. She raised the prospect of my writing an autobiography. Uh, my first response was, um, at, how old was I then? I think I was 27. Uh, how could I possibly write an autobiography? I was far too young. So that was the beginning of our friendship. Angela came to the office and we talked to see whether she liked or trusted me. And she did. And so she wrote the book. I edited it, shaped it a little bit. She helped me to think about a very different type of writing by asking me, well, what was in the room? What did it look like? What did it sound like? Uh, and uh, eventually, the autobiography emerged from those conversations. Morrison was a mentor to others, but all the while, she was writing. She was leading a double life. I was in the secretarial pool at Random House. And she said, would you please type something for me? So we said, sure, fine. We realized later that we were typing parts of the bluest eye. I would often ride with her from her house to the office in Manhattan. She always had a small pad nearby and a pen. And when the traffic stopped, she would write something. She was also a single mother with two small sons. And at her house, cooking for her sons, she might take 30 seconds out of that task and she would scribble something down. She was really so immersed in the lives of her characters that she was living simultaneously in two worlds. How did you manage all that? I am only aware now of the errors I made, uh, the difficulties, because during the time of rearing them and working and running about, it was just the next thing to do. I remember sitting in my office with a yellow legal pad, and I was so overwhelmed that I wrote a list of everything I had to do, everything. You know, 
something my mother, something New York Times, you know, everything, everything. And then I decided to write what I wanted to do. And there were two things. The first was mother my children. The second was write books. You think I don't know what your life is like just because I ain't living it? I know what every colored woman in this country is doing. What's that? Dying? Just like me. But the difference is they dying like a stump. Me? I'm going down like one of those redwoods. I sure did live in this world. Really? What have you got to show for it? Show? To who? Girl, I got my mind. And what goes on in it? Which is to say, I got me. After the success of her third book, Song of Solomon, she gave up her job in publishing to write, though she kept one foot on the ground by teaching too. She wasn't just championing women and their lives, she wanted men to be free too. Song of Solomon was very representative of the world my father had come from black bourgeoisie, but it was also uh, an evocation of something I was afraid of for myself, which was to claim space. Um, how did you claim space and not um, suffer as a black man? The entire book turned my world around by showing me that I had been living there the whole time. I just had, had never had any language for it. The main character in Song of Solomon is known as Milkman because he was breastfed for so long. His father was called Macon Dead. Slaves had no names of their own. They were called after their owners or had made up names. I'm always intrigued to know what people are going to be called in your books, whether it's you doing it or it's really, you know, where it comes from. They tell me. What, what their names are. They tell you what their yeah. names are. Do they speak to you, your characters? Oh, yeah. You know, I can, um, if I use the wrong name, nothing happens with the character. If I get the right name, if I hear it right, then they come alive. They sometimes kind of threaten you a little bit in uh, Song of Solomon, Pilot. I had to shut her up. Macon dead. Where did that come from? Oh, well some historical stuff I read about freed slaves taking names and getting names and choosing names and the indifference of the northerners who were writing this down. Papa couldn't read, couldn't even sign his name, had a mark he used. They tricked him. He signed something, I don't know what, and they told him they owned his property. He never read nothing. Everything bad that ever happened to him happened because he couldn't read. Got his name messed up because he couldn't read. His name? How? When freedom came, all the colored people in the state had to register with the Freedmen's Bureau. Your father was a slave? What kind of foolish question is that? Of course he was. Papa was in his teens and went to sign up, but the man behind the desk was drunk. He asked Papa where he was born. Papa said, Macon. Then he asked him who his father was. Papa said, he's dead. Well, the Yankee wrote it all down, but in the wrong spaces. And in the space of his name, the fool wrote, dead, comma, Macon. But Papa couldn't read, so he never found out what he was registered as till mama told him. Even if it's hundreds of oh, years yeah, ago, it doesn't, yes. it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. The past colors the present, and the present contorts the past. So that's life. You have to live like that. Slavery haunts her books. Beloved is the story of Sethi, a slave woman who escapes the South across the Ohio River. The Ohio was their River Jordan, their passage to the Promised Land. 
But even north of the river, Sethi and her baby were not safe. She could be seized by slave catchers and taken back south. Inside, two boys bled in the sawdust and dirt at the feet of a nigger woman holding a blood-soaked child to her chest with one hand and an infant by the heels on the other. She did not look at them. She simply swung the baby toward the wall planks, missed and tried to connect a second time when out of nowhere, the old nigger boy, still mewing, ran through the door behind them and snatched the baby from the arc of its mother's swing. It's the dead baby, beloved, who returns to haunt Sethi's house. This slave pen was just south of the Ohio River on a farm in Kentucky, a farm like Sweet Home, where Sethi was raped and savagely beaten. My great-grandfather I got to see every day, and he was born before slavery ended. Uh, and his family was brought across from Virginia into Kentucky. This building is a human warehouse, uh, a place where people of African descent were kept and stored and then later marched from Kentucky uh, 760 miles to Natchez, Mississippi to be sold. Sold by skin color, by skill. One of the myths is we were only good for farm labor. My great grandfather was the Westmoreland's blacksmith. Uh, as my dad told me when I was eight, anything that it was made of metal on that plantation. My great-grandfather made it. So their value uh, was twice that of the ordinary slave, sometimes three times. In America, one of the most painful parts of being despised is being told you're nobody, and that you have no history, you have no value, and that uh, you're just a burden, a waste. People think that we came here to take something, to be given something. This building teaches that we came and we had value, we built, we contributed, and, and that when people needed money, we were sold just like a tractor or, or something of real value. And that in the process, these people with dark skin, uh, people with beige skin, people with almost white skin, helped build America. Toni Morrison said she saw no memorials to slavery. So that was what Beloved was for. Her words inspired people to make a memorial. There is no place you or I can go to think about or not think about to summon the presences of or recollect the absences of slaves. There's no 300-foot tower. There's no small bench by the road. This is now a place to sit and remember. She shouted, let the children come. And they ran from the trees toward her. Let your mothers hear you laugh, she told them and the woods rang. The adults looked on and could not help smiling. Then, let the grown men come, she shouted. They stepped out one by one from among the ringing trees. Let your wives and your children see you dance, she told them, and ground life shuddered under their feet. Finally, she called the woman to her. Cry, she told them, for the living and the dead, just cry. And without covering their eyes, the women let loose. It started that way, laughing children, dancing men, crying women, and then it got mixed up. Women stopped crying and danced. Men sat down and cried. Children danced, women laughed, children cried until, exhausted and riven, all and each lay about the clearing, damp and gasping for breath.
through that account of a woman who would rather kill her child than see it sold into slavery, I came to understand something about a history that I'd been studying that I'd never understood before. Just the way the language moved, the music, the underlying music of the language was so delightful to me. It was so, um, it was just so intensely pleasurable a reading experience, notwithstanding the heartbreaking subject matter, that I remember thinking, not only is this the way that I want to write one day, this is the only thing I ever really want to read. And that there was this literary master being introduced to me who looked in some way like me, meant the world to me. All empty beds, spring corn has led. Feel like old Ned, wish I was dead all my life through. I've been so black and blue. Singing was never just entertainment. It was always about something. It was like a powerful, rhythmic sound of poetry. The spirituals, the blues. You know, it's always interesting to me that the blues is about lost love. Yeah. When a man loves a woman, or where's my man? But they're never stingy. For me, it's identifiably part and heart of the black culture. It's that generosity and that openness. Somebody once said, nobody loves like black people. When spring comes to the city, People notice one another in the road. On trolleys and park benches, they settle fines on a seat in which hundreds have done it to. Copper coins dropped in the pan have been swallowed by children and tested by gypsies, but it's still money. And people smile at that. It's the time of year when the city urges contradiction most, giving you a taste for a single room occupied by you alone, as well as craving to share it with someone you passed in the street. I love the lyricism of, of her writing. You read a paragraph, you think, oh, that is wonderful, why can't I think like that or talk like that, because there is music in her writing. It's free form, fragmented, wheeling around in time, just like jazz. Tony is influenced by a multiplicity of traditions. African-American cultural traditions as well as high modernist traditions. And so many of the things that we might find um, curious, such as disrespect for chronology, are traits that we can find in masterworks of 20th century literature. She has appropriated those techniques in telling these tales that have nothing to do with the high modernist tradition. I'm crazy about this city. Daylight slants like a razor, cutting the buildings in half. The city, in 1926, at last, at last, everything's ahead. Here comes the new, look out. There goes the sad stuff, the bad stuff, the things nobody could help stuff. The way everybody was then and there, forget that. History is over. I'll never forget that image in Beloved, where there are two little, uh, the, the, the imprints of the two little uh, hands of a child uh, on a cake, you know? It's just, uh, it takes one's breath away in the way that uh, many 
poems, but few novels do. In Toni Morrison's writing, the pressure per square inch is very high. Toni Morrison won the Pulitzer Prize for Beloved and went on to win the Nobel. She says two things matter to her, being a writer and a mother. She's always been both. That's a victory, that. Sadly, her second son, Slade, died five years ago of cancer. She lives surrounded by his paintings and his picture. They will blow it, she thought. Each will cling to a sad little story of hurt and sorrows. What waste. She knew from personal experience how hard loving was, how selfish, and how easily sundered, withholding sex or relying on it, ignoring children or devouring them. I was pretty once. She thought real pretty, and I believed it was enough. And now she lived alone in the wilderness, knitting and tatting away, grateful that at last sweet Jesus had given her a forgetfulness blanket along with a little pillow of wisdom to comfort her in old age. <laughs> I like her. <laughs> 